the food we eat the air we breathe the various cleansing agents that we use and even the human emotions are sometimes the result of chemical reactions that take place in our body hence chemistry is a big part of our everyday life so now we are beginning with the first chapter that is some basic concepts of chemistry so how would you define chemistry chemistry is the study of matter its physical and chemical properties and the physical and chemical changes it undergoes under different conditions so matter we know it is something that occupies space physical properties means it is going to give us information about the color odor texture melting point boiling point etc chemical properties would give us information regarding the chemical reactions that take place and bring about a change chemistry is called as central science why so because the knowledge of chemistry is required in the study of physics biological science applied science earth science space science etc so basically you are using chemistry in all the other subjects and that is why they have concluded that chemistry is a central science chemistry is very much applicable in our everyday life for example the air we breathe the food we eat now most probably when you go to shops you will consider the quality of the food and not the quantity why so because it undergoes the process of quality assessment which comes under chemistry you all must have observed a marked sign which stands for food safety and standards authority of india so if this mark is present on the food packet then it means that it is safe to consume because it has undergone all the necessary requirements chemistry also plays an important role in clothing now when you all go for shopping some of you either prefer branded clothes some of you don't then some opt for a particular pattern on the clothes then some might go for different types of fabrics or different colors all this is related to chemistry the coloring of the clothes is called as dye which is also studied under organic chemistry similarly the fabric that is used for making the cloth comes under polymer chemistry also in transportation and fuel supplies chemistry plays an important role though chemistry is an ancient science there is lot of development and advancement that has taken place in science and technology similarly even chemistry has developed and evolved as modern science what do i mean when i say technological development so there are lot of instruments that are developed which are actually expanding the knowledge of chemistry which are used for separation techniques for separating different components that are present in mixtures also they are used in applied sciences like medicine dentistry engineering agriculture and also in our daily home use products dentistry means related to teeth now we shall study the nature of chemistry so chemistry is classified into five branches that is organic chemistry inorganic chemistry physical chemistry biochemistry and analytical chemistry organic chemistry gives us information regarding the properties and reactions of compounds of carbon so keep in mind when you say organic chemistry you are going to study one element in detail and that is carbon second is inorganic chemistry so inorganic chemistry is the study of all substances which are not organic so in inorganic chemistry we are going to study about all the other elements apart from carbon next is physical chemistry so physical chemistry is going to give us information regarding the properties of matter the study of atoms molecules the fundamental concepts related to electrons energies etc next is biochemistry so this is a combination of biology along with chemistry 
example would be the reactions that take place in human body or you can say the chemical processes related to living organisms is termed as biochemistry last is analytical chemistry so analytical chemistry involves separation techniques one of the example is if you want to separate out the different components that are present in the mixture then you will have to use the study of analytical chemistry what is matter so till now you must have studied matter is something that occupies space and also has mass for example if i take a chalk then the chalk is a matter because it has mass and if i keep that chalk down on the table then of course it is going to occupy some space there so chalk is an example of matter based on chemical composition matter is further divided into pure substances and mixtures let us now study what are this pure substances and mixtures pure substances are those which have a definite chemical composition so they are going to always have the same properties regardless of their origin and examples of pure substances are pure metal distilled water etc diamond is an example of pure substance so no matter from where the mining of diamond is done the chemical composition is going to remain the same how do the mixtures differ from pure substances so mixtures are not going to have definite chemical composition and also they are not going to have definite properties example of mixture is paint which is a mixture of oil pigment and additive the second example would be concrete which is a mixture of sand cement and water bhel that we eat is also an example of mixture so if you go to different shops of course the taste of the bhel is going to be different because they are going to add different ingredients according to their measurements pure substances are further classified as elements and compounds elements are defined as the pure substance which cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical changes so example of element would be gold silver copper etc this elements are further classified as metals non metals and metalloids let us now study the properties of metals non metals and metalloids which actually distinguish them from each other so metals are said to have a luster luster means shiny appearance also metals are considered as good conductors of heat and electricity example are the copper and aluminium wires then metals are also drawn into wire which we say that metals have the property of ductility ductility means you can convert the metal in the form of wire now the next property is metals are malleable which means you can hammer the metal and then you can form them into thin sheets so the example of metals would be gold silver copper iron etc now we move on to non metals the properties of non metals are opposite to those of metals so the first point is non metals do not have luster that means they do not have shine except for diamond and iodine diamond and iodine is a non metal but they do have shine the second property is they are poor conductors of heat and electricity except for one non metal which is graphite then non metals do not show the property of malleability that is you cannot hammer them and convert them into thin sheets also they are non ductile means you cannot convert them into wire because they are very brittle brittle means though they are hard you can easily break it off for example chalk now chalk is said to be brittle why so because it is hard but if i apply little force then it is going to break off easily now what are metalloids so some elements which have properties intermediate between metals and non metals are called as metalloids or semi metals 
means the elements which are going to have properties those of metals as well as non metals are called as metalloids example of metalloids are arsenic silicon and germanium with this we have finished with elements now we move on to compounds so what is the definition of compounds so compounds are pure substances which can be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical changes let us consider the example of sodium chloride sodium chloride has the formula of nacl nacl will split up as na plus plus cl minus so the compound is splitting into its elements next are mixtures so mixtures contain two or more substances in no fixed proportions and they can be separated by physical methods the example that i gave you for mixture was bhel mixtures are further classified into two types homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures now the word homo stands for same and hetero stands for different so homogeneous mixtures are going to have same face and heterogeneous mixture are going to have a different face or you can say two or more faces example of homogeneous mixture could be alcohol and water or sugar and water so when you mix sugar and water once the sugar has dissolved completely in water you won't be able to figure out where are the sugar molecules and where are the water molecules so it appears as one face whereas in heterogeneous mixtures you can easily figure out the two phases for example oil in water so even after mixing oil and water vigorously after some time you will see that a layer of oil is separated from water so the two layers can be seen distinctly another example of heterogeneous mixture would be stone in water so you can easily figure out the stone and water so this are going to be the two phases and hence it is an example of heterogeneous mixture next we move on to the states of matter there are three states of matter which are solid liquid and gas this is a picture which explains the packing of atoms molecules in solids liquids and gases respectively we know that solids have a definite shape and volume but what is the reason for this property it is because the constituent atoms or molecules are tightly held in a perfect order so you can observe the same thing in the picture the atoms and molecules they are tightly packed and that is why solid has a perfect shape if you observe for liquid then there is little space between the two atoms or molecules so you can say that liquid contain particles close to each other but they can move around within the liquid but if you observe the gas then the atoms and molecules are far away from each other and they are always in a random motion hence they keep colliding with each other the three states of matter are interconvertible which means you can convert solid into liquid liquid into gas or gas into liquid or liquid into solid but how is that possible only if you are changing the temperature and pressure for example if you take ice if you apply heat which means you are applying temperature then the ice is going to melt so solid is getting converted into liquid if you further apply heat to the liquid means now you are increasing the temperature then the liquid will get converted into gaseous state in the form of vapors if you apply pressure then you can convert gases into liquids and liquids into solid now we move on to the properties of matter and their measurement different kinds of matter have their different distinct characteristic properties now these properties are classified into two categories physical properties and chemical properties so how would you define physical properties these are those properties which can be measured or observed 
without changing the chemical composition of the substance. For example, if I give you the element sodium, so you can talk about the color, the texture, what would be its melting point, etc. Hence, some of the examples of physical properties are color, odor, melting point, boiling point, density, etc. Density means the weight of that particular substance. Next are chemical properties. So these are the properties where substance is going to undergo a chemical change and thereby it is going to exhibit a change in the chemical composition. So initially coal had its own chemical composition. When it reacted with air, the product formed was carbon dioxide. So now of course the composition is going to change. First it was coal which has a formula of carbon that is C and after reacting with air it combines with oxygen which means and we get a formula CO2 that is carbon dioxide. So the chemical composition of elements is also changing. Other example of chemical property would be the burning of magnesium wire in the presence of air which gives the formation of magnesium oxide. So magnesium wire has the formula Mg and when it comes in contact with air that is oxygen it forms magnesium oxide which is denoted by MgO. Next question is how are you going to measure this physical and chemical properties? Many properties of matter are quantitative in nature. Now what does this word quantitative mean? It means connected with amount or number. So when you measure something you have to compare it with some standard and the standard which is fixed is not going to change it is unchanging many properties of matter like mass length area pressure volume time etc are quantitative in nature which means we can measure the amount so any quantitative measurement is expressed by a number followed by unit for example, if you are measuring the length of the classroom, it can be represented as 10 meter. So 10 is the number and M denotes meter which is the unit used to represent the length. Now how are the standards fixed? They are fixed depending on the universally accepted criteria. For example, if in India kg stands for the measurement of mass then even in any other country kg stands for the measurement of mass only mass won't be measured in terms of volume or liters so the arbitrarily decided and universally accepted standards are called as units arbitrarily means it is not based on any reason or plan and sometimes it can even be unfair universally accepted means i told you it is accepted all over the world there are several systems in which units are expressed in terms of C, G, S. C is centimeter for length, G gram for mass and S second for time. Also in terms of F, P, S that is foot, pound and second and the last is M, K, S system where M stands for meter, K stands for kilogram and S stands for second. In 1960, the General Conference of Weights and Measure, they proposed a revised metric system which was called as the International System of Units that is the SI units. The metric system which actually originated or started in France in the late 18th century was found to be more convenient because it was based on the decimal system but it was not possible to use all these different kinds of system so a common standard system that was the international system of units which we use today that those are the SI units were established so the SI system has seven base units other units like speed volume density etc can be derived from these quantities so this is a table which shows the seven base units. So the first column is the base physical quantity. The next stands for the symbol for quantity. Then you have the name of SI unit. And last is the symbol for SI unit. 
so first is length which is denoted by the symbol l si unit is meter and the symbol used is m second is mass the symbol used for denoting mass is small m it is measured in terms of kilogram denoted by kg next is time denoted by the small letter t measured in terms of seconds denoted by the symbol small s next is electric current denoted by capital letter i measured in terms of ampere denoted by capital letter a next is thermodynamic temperature denoted by capital letter t measured in terms of kelvin and denoted by capital letter k amount of substance is denoted by small letter n measured in terms of mole and the symbol used is mol last is luminous intensity which is denoted by capital letter i and subscript v the si unit to measure luminous intensity is candela and the symbol used is cd now we are going to study some physical properties in detail which are mass and weight length volume density and temperature first we shall start with mass and weight we know that matter has mass so it is going to be a property of matter so how would you define it it is the measure of quantity of matter a body contains the mass of a body is not going to change as its position changes whereas on the other hand the weight of the body is going to change according to the gravitational attraction which means mass and weight is not same so mass is the amount of matter that is present and weight is measure of force that is exerted on the object by gravity hence it is concluded that mass of a body is more fundamental property than its weight the si unit of mass is kilogram which is denoted by kg but gram which is denoted by g is also used if you want to weigh small amounts so you can use the conversion of 1 kg is equal to 1000 g this 1000 g you can also write it as 10 raised to 3 g the raised to power 3 stands for 3 zeros next we move on to length when you measure the atomic radius bond length wavelength of electromagnetic radiation we come across the physical property of length if you are measuring the atomic radius bond length or wavelength of electromagnetic radiations then the lengths are going to be very small since we know that atom is not naked to our eyes which means it is very very small so the smaller si unit of length is used which is nanometer and picometer nanometer is denoted by nm and picometer is denoted by pm 1 nanometer corresponds to 10 raised to minus 9 meter so you can see when you have 10 raised to minus 9 minus 9 means it is going to be in decimal form prior to number 1 so this is going to be 0.0000000001 so that is going to be very small similarly the value for 1 picometer is 10 raised to minus 12 meter so more the number in minus more smaller the value it is going to be next is volume how do you define volume it is the amount of space occupied by a three dimensional object for example if i take water and if i pour that water in a bottle so we know that it is going to take the shape of the bottle and also the amount of space which is occupied by the water in the water bottle is called as the volume so for measurement of volume of liquids and gases a common unit liter is used which is not actually an si unit hence we need to do some conversions so 1 liter corresponds to 1 dm cube so which is further going to give you 1000 ml which also gives you 1000 cm cube now 1000 cm cube you can even write it as 10 cm into 10 cm into 10 cm hence you can conclude that the si unit of volume is meter cube
Also, there are different kinds of glasswares which are used to measure the volumes of liquids and solutions. So, if you observe this picture, you can see there is a graduated cylinder, burette, pipette, etc. This is a picture of a volumetric flask. And volumetric flask is used to prepare a known volume of solution. For example, if I tell you that I want to prepare a solution of 0.1 molar, then we are supposed to weigh the amount of substance required, add water, and there is a mark. We have to add water only till this mark, which will give you the solution of that particular molarity. Also, these are the different types of apparatus which we used in laboratory for measuring volumes of liquid. Next is density. Density is defined as mass per unit volume. So, if I tell you to determine the density of a particular substance, then you will have to measure the mass as well as the volume of a sample. So, the formula used to calculate density is mass divided by volume and it is one of the most characteristic property of a substance. The SI unit of density can be calculated as follows. So you will write the SI unit of mass upon the SI unit of volume. We know that mass is measured in terms of kg and volume is measured in terms of meter cube. So now if you want to write it in one line, you can write it as kg m raised to minus 3. Now the term which was in the denominator m3 when you bring it up the 3 there is going to get a minus sign. So this is the SI unit of density that is kg per meter cube. The CGS unit is in terms of gram divided by milliliter. If you want to bring that ml up you will have to write minus 1 because it is coming up or you can even write it as g centimeter raised to minus 3. Last physical property is temperature. So temperature is a measure of the hotness or coldness of an object. You can measure temperature in three ways that is degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit and Kelvin. But we know that Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature. If you have observed the thermometer which is in terms of Celsius scale then it is starting from 0 degree Celsius to 100 degree Celsius. Now these two temperatures are nothing but the freezing point and boiling point of water at atmospheric pressure. 0 degree Celsius is the freezing point of water and 100 degree Celsius is the boiling point of water. If you observe the same on the Fahrenheit scale then it corresponds to 32 degree Fahrenheit and 212 degree Fahrenheit. The degree Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales are related to each other by the following equation. So degree Fahrenheit is equal to 9 divided by 5 degree Celsius plus 32. So this formula can be used to convert the temperatures from degree Celsius to degree Fahrenheit. The Kelvin scale is related to Celsius scale as follows. So Kelvin is equal to degree Celsius plus 273.15. Whenever you are given temperature in terms of degree Celsius, you always have to convert it in terms of Kelvin since the SI unit of temperature is Kelvin. So you just have to add up 273.15 to degree Celsius. This is a picture which gives us information regarding the Kelvin, Celsius and the Fahrenheit scale. So this was all about our first session today. We have completed introduction, nature of chemistry, matter, pure substances versus mixtures. Then we have studied states of matter, properties of matter and their measurements, the measurements of properties. SI units, physical properties like mass and weight, length, volume, density and temperature. In the next session we will be studying about the laws of chemical combination.